Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming to our talk on autonomous killer weapons. Um, yeah, this is going to be a very light conversation for a Saturday afternoon, so I hope you guys are really excited about that. Uh, my name is Liz O'Sullivan, and this is Marta Kuzmina, and we do represent the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. Uh, who here has heard of Killer Robots before? Can we do a raise of the hand? Yes, that means the campaign is doing our job. We've got 115 <laughs> member organizations, sorry, 115 member organizations across 55 countries, and we're still growing. Um, basically, the campaign to stop killer robots is all about preserving meaningful human control over weapon systems. Our goal is to secure an international treaty to ban fully autonomous weapons. So in our talk today, we're going to go through what is a killer robot anyway? Um, why is it an ethical concern that we're considering seeding the decision to take a human life to a machine algorithm? Um, how people are getting involved and why it matters, and also what's been done already and why we still need your help. Yep. So We'll also talk a little bit about what technologies are being used to achieve this goal of creating autonomous killer weapons and um, you know what you might do if you find yourself in a situation where you might be working on them or contributing research to the cause. So here's just a short um, intro video to let you know more about the All right, so now that we've scared the pants off of you, we hope, um, we will introduce ourselves and get started with a really detailed technical ethical discussion about what uh, we are trying to fight to make sure it never happens. And um, just to start off, I'm, I'm sure you've probably never heard of either one of us, but um, my name is, as I said, Liz, and I worked in, um, I've worked in AI for about eight years total. I started out at a, an NLP company that did uh, recruitment ad job advertising. And um, most recently, I worked at a, a computer vision company called Clarify, where I was the head of the labeling services. Um, so you probably know when you create AI models, you have to train algorithms using hundreds of thousands or millions of labeled data points. Um, and that's actually where I first fell in love with the field of fat ML. It's kind of a cheesy name, but it stands for Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning. Um, because labeling services can actually generate a, quite a lot of bias in the, the machine learning models that they create. Um, since then, I've joined a nonprofit that is called the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project um, and another one called Tech Inquiry, which seeks to connect um, organizations that work in tech um, and the people who work there with the government to try to help explain and, and clarify some of the technology questions that these legislators might have. Um, I also co-founded a small, um, sorry, uh, uh, it's distracting. <laughs> um, I co-founded an AI explainability company with the hope of making some of these issues a little bit clearer and better. Um, and uh, I have a kind of an interesting story to tell, which I'll get into later on in the presentation. But uh, for right now, that's me, and I'll let Marta introduce herself. So I'm Marta. I've been researching conflict situations and human rights abuses for about four years, mostly in the context of human rights and weapons. I started when the conflict broke out between Ukraine and Russia, and I was doing research there, and I saw quite clearly how weapons proliferation and conflict spreads and how it affects civilians in that area. And then I worked at Human Rights Watch in Washington, D.C. Uh, for a few years, basically looking through hours upon hours of the immediate aftermath of airstrikes in Syria via open source video footage um, 
doing research there, tracking, tracking cluster munition attacks. And so I saw firsthand about the devastating impact that those weapons can have on civilians. And while I was at Human Rights Watch, I also worked on the campaign to stop killer robots. And that's when I realized that these weapons will kind of be the next frontier of what we'll see in future wars, unless we do something about it now, um, preemptively and before the technology is deployed. Um, there are no victims of killer robots yet, but I don't want to be doing research on them 20 years, 10 years in the future. So before we get started with the ethical arguments for or against uh, autonomous weapons, uh, we thought we would take a few minutes just to define what they actually are. Uh, and this may seem like it's a little bit obvious, but in fact, there are lots of different degrees and shades of autonomy in current warfare and more even that are proposed in the future. Um, so what is our definition of a fully autonomous weapon? Well, a fully autonomous weapon can, from a set of candidate targets, select, acquire, and destroy that exact target or set of targets um, without control from a human being who is authorizing each individual kill. When we talk about autonomous weapons, it's easy to sort of imagine them as a single drone that's maybe got a commander back at home who's watching the video feed. But ultimately, a big part of the fear for uh, our campaign is that there won't just be one. Um, most likely, due to some of the research coming out of DARPA, there will be swarms of them that are communicating with each other and in a lot of ways, um, in ways that we, we don't or can't understand. So a key notion in this discussion is the human in the loop question. What is a human in the loop? Does anybody here work in AI or around AI? Is this a term that's familiar? I know some of you uh, do as well. Um, but a human in the loop is essentially a touch point between the prediction of the algorithm and the action that it's designed to take that would allow an approval or an authorization. Um, a lot of current AI technologies secretly have humans in the loop that are validating or correcting predictions uh, in real time. There are some AI companies that provide this service. Um, but the likeliest way that we'll encounter fully autonomous weapons right now, um, just practically speaking, looking at the different kinds of systems that are in place, are through autonomous killer drones um, involving aerial photography and a technology called object detection, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, speaking of aerial photography and object detection, uh, has anyone heard of Project Maven? Couple people? Okay, it's been in the news a little bit. Um, so that was a DOD contract that was put out by, um, you know, the it now is eventually transferred into the Joint Artificial Intelligence Committee, or we're going to call it Jake. Um, but it's something that Microsoft, Amazon, and at one point Google were tasked with uh, working on. And essentially, it's just a point of view from an aerial standpoint, looking down at the world and trying to find out where within that photo or video stream, these various objects, namely people, facilities, vehicles, um, are actually going to be. And this is a core part of the uh, race towards autonomous drones or weapons in general, because this is a piece that would allow us to uh, understand where in space um, the physical target that this weapon seeks to destroy actually is. Um, so I'm not going to, and no one can really, make the bold claim to say that Project Maven is about autonomous killer weapons, uh, but it does seem like it is a fundamental part of it, which may explain why there's so much interest from the Department of Defense to push it into Silicon Valley and to have as many companies competing to work on this uh, very core technology um, right now. So we're now going to talk a little bit about what kinds of weapons that are varying degrees of autonomous in practice today. Um, and for that, I'll see the, the mic to Marta. She's, she's very experienced in this. <laughs> as, Liz, as Liz mentioned, probably the first thing you think of is an unmanned aerial vehicle, or more commonly known as an armed drone. Um, these usually have long ranges. They're able to carry a payload, a missile or artillery system. And Originally, uh, when the United States Air Force and the Central Intelligence Agency used these back in the 90s, they were only for surveillance and reconnaissance. Fast forward less than 10 years, and we added arms to armed drones. Um, so in 2001, the first armed drone, the Predator, the US um, MP1 Predator drone, uh, flew over Iraq and Afghanistan, and just less than a year later, it made its first kill. And now, fast forward to 2019, that system is already retired. It's hanging in a museum in the Smithsonian, and 
Um, it's been succeeded by subsequent systems like the Reaper, which actually has a longer range, can carry a bigger payload, and is used widely in a handful of countries today, and has been sold and proliferated over and over again. Um, and we don't have a lot of transparency on the numbers and the actual attacks of where these systems are used. So that's another big thing for people who are tracking these conflicts and trying to have accountability for victims and tracking civilian casualties. Um, as you can imagine, Department of Defense is not very forthcoming. <laughs> Uh, we also have loitering munitions, which basically took all of the technology that went into UAVs and made them much smaller. And um, they consequently have smaller ranges, but they are able to basically hover over a designated area and seek out their target. Again, back in the 90s, Israel invented their Harpy drone, which uh, was mainly using sensor technology and seeking out radars uh, to evade radars, that's why it was made smaller. Um, but as sensor tech improved, they actually came out with a new version called the Harup, also Israeli, and that one now has the ability to return home. So the Harpy was basically like a kamikaze drone. It flew into its target and it was single time use. And then um, the Harup now, if it doesn't find its target, it could come back, which is obviously um, financially beneficial. Uh, so it it's, has double the range, it has double the loitering time. So imagine a weapon that's able to seek out its target. You can't hide, um, whether it uses biometric sensing or facial recognition technology, it is going to hunt its target to the ends of the earth. Um, you can't escape it. And so the this loitering munitions specifically was used in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan in 2016, and six people were killed, uh, so it's definitely deployed and operational. And it has a semi-autonomous mode and a fully autonomous mode. And then also there's air defense systems, like the Israeli Iron Dome, which basically seeks out um, incoming missiles, and but there's still a human operator who has to confirm launching the, the counter strike. So the system is able to detect the missile, it alerts the human operator, human operator pulls a proverbial trigger. Um, these can be in a fixed location or they can be put on a Navy ship and then obviously they move, but they are limited in range, limited in scope and time and the payloads are able to carry. So with the current state of technology, there's some limitations, but as we see, they're getting smaller, they're getting faster, they're able to um, loiter for longer times, eventually they'll be able to be refueled um, autonomously as well. So the scope of operations is growing and growing as these weapons are used. Uh, we also have other semi-autonomous systems that are more ground-based, uh, like sentry weapons, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, that can basically guard borders or perimeters. And ID targets, as you can see in that picture, there's lots of different sensing technologies, as well as some heavy artillery attached to it. And you can do something similar for unmanned ground vehicles, where uh, they, they can be used alongside troops or ahead of soldiers to scope out the situation. And you can envision these being used for a logistics purpose, like carrying extra supplies or fuel or injured soldiers. But you can also stick weapons on them, and now it's an armed, unmanned ground vehicle. And right now, the key thing here is that all of these have human operators. There is human control attached to all of these systems, but progressively we're, we're seeing that diminish more and more, and that's our concern, that there's no stop gaps, there's no, um, there's nothing stopping this technological progress except for maybe policymakers who are not as informed on these, um, the, the technical expertise of this as much as they should be. 
So it's also worth mentioning that these are simply the uh, weapons that we actually have access to see, which means that behind the scenes, there's likely to be several more classified degree programs coming out of DARPA um, or any of the government agencies who are working on these things. Um, in fact, the U.S., uh, to Marta's point, uh, is was the first country to develop a policy to prohibit autonomy in weapons, um, or so they claim. Um, they do it in a directive called 3000.09, which uh, dictates that appropriate human control is mandatory. Um, but even the author of this policy, someone who's written a book about um, AI and warfare and specifically autonomous warfare, um, admits in his book that this policy is not restrictive. Um, that it's entirely possible for a general to take a request for a proposal to his superiors and to get authorization to build, use, or deploy this kind of weapon. Um, and so one of the things that we try to do to understand maybe what's going on behind the scenes are look at the programs that are coming out of DARPA um, and the programs that are requested by DARPA in their RFPs on uh, FedGov which is the way that they um, issue tenders for applications. Um, so one of these programs that is declassified out of DARPA is called CODE or Collaborative, I always forget the acronyms, <laughs> Collaborative Operations in Denied Environment. Um, and basically this is a program that would allow a swarm of drones to talk to each other um, and to work as a unit and to do that in a signal, den signal denied environment. Um, so if I recall correctly, these uh, drones can communicate with each other with as little as a 56K connection. So uh, think back to your AOL phone lines, if any of you are old enough to remember that. And um, so that's the, the smallest amount of um, bandwidth that they need to actually talk to each other. And so drone swarms, again, are the main concern here in this present moment in time. Um, but as far as unmanned uh, land vehicles, there's also another program that is coming out of DARPA. At this point, it's still on the whiteboard, and they're requesting people to start working on this kind of thing. Um, but what's very interesting is that in every article that the press publishes about this notion of autonomous weapons, uh, they tend to mention Directive 3000.09 as a saving grace and say, you know, we were building di different degrees of supervised uh, autonomy and that this is the future of warfare, but we still have this one policy that's protecting us from creating Terminators or whatever the scary sci-fi version of what we're talking about in reality. <laughs> But it's such a graphic image. It just conveys it. Um, so I'll be saying Terminator in a minute. Uh -oh. <laughs> great, great. Um, thank you. So it's it's not Terminator. Instead, it's called Atlas, and this is an unmanned ground vehicle. Um, very generic description in the RFP. Um, you know, it has to have wheels. It has to have a gun. Blah blah blah. Um, but there's one section in this RFP that stood out to me immediately, which is called fire control. And that under the bullet pointed list of fire control, there are the requirements of what kinds of fire control this design system would have to have. And one of the words in there was um, fully automated. So it seems that they're playing this against both sides of the fence, right? And on the one hand, educating the public and saying, uh, we are a democratic nation, we have policy, we value human life, and then simultaneously uh, creating opportunities for Silicon Valley to push this, um, and I'll use this phrase very, very limitedly, but this arms race forward. So if you are following these issues closely, as well as um, Marta and I are because we're very concerned with surveillance applications of this technology, you'll see that there's this really common trend about things that are developed in the excuse of warfare uh, for defense or for uh, competition or rivalry. And then 20 years later, you see it start to make its way domestically and come here to the United States. And so we are already seeing the surveillance drones uh, make it to domestic uh, USA, which is very troubling. Um, and I think with the rise of Amazon's drones and all of these policies that are developing for drone deliveries to be available and to be legal and regulated, we'll start to see more and more cameras on these drones. And, and that is, again, the type of escalation that puts us all at risk. So as Liz mentioned, the campaign is also concerned about less than lethal or non-lethal uses of fully autonomous weapons. Um, in my opinion, there's no such thing as a less than lethal type weapon. They all sustain injuries that can be severe and can lead to death. Um, anything from like tear gas to rubber bullets to what the examples here, the most recent one is from the Hong Kong pro protest back in July. This is a US company called Non-Lethal Technologies. Um, and basically you deliver tear gas on protesters. Um, 
protesters and you can cause injuries. Um, and as you can see, it says right there, do not fire directly at, at persons, but <laughs> that's not in fact how it's being used. It's actually being fired directly at protesters. And we see that um, over and over again um, to quell revolutions, rebellions, protests, whatever it may be, oftentimes against unarmed civilians. Uh, over on the bottom, you see an Israeli drone that is dispersing small tear gas canisters, and that was used um, on the border with Gaza, um, with Israel and Palestine. And then uh, the one on the right is an interesting example. So this was from 2016. Um, if you remember, there was protests going on against against police, basically, and there was a sniper in Dallas who shot and killed five police officers. And so what they decided to do was take this, basically, ground vehicle that was not armed, put a pound of C4 on it, and drive it to uh, the sniper and kill him. And as far as I know, that's the first instance of a robot killing a US citizen semi-autonomously. Um, so you can imagine, again, these all have human operators that are directing these to a certain target, but you can imagine with improved technology, um, they're easily made fully autonomous. Um, and if you have a leader um, who's facing a revolution and he's got unarmed protesters or civilians, and he directs the military to fire on his own people or her own people. Um, the military can refuse to fire, but when it comes to a machine, a robot, that's pre-programmed, it will fire on those protesters. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. I wanna get back just really quickly. Um, a really good example from 13 years ago and the state of technology that was back then. Um, in the demilitarized zone between South Korea and North Korea, there was a robotic sentry weapon that basically used heat signatures and other sensor technology, and it could identify people crossing that zone. It was a South Korean weapon, and they put it on the border in full autonomous mode. And what happened, there was a huge international outcry because Refugees that were crossing from North Korea to South Korea, that weapon can't distinguish between a soldier and a civilian and a refugee. And so thankfully the international community pressure actually forced the South Koreans to put this weapon back into semi-autonomous mode where a soldier has to make a visual ID and then activate the system. But that was 13 years ago and as Liz said, there's many new systems that are at play today. And so that's kind of an outline of systems that exist. And now I want to switch into talking, you know, the ethics village. Let's talk about the ethics of it. And Good. I was getting ready to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> if you. I think we understand that these weapons are horrible. And I also um, would like to say that what the question I would have is what – can this campaign do to actually stop this when this is going to happen, whether or not we do anything about um, how do we defend against folks who want to use killer robots against us if we don't build our own? What are we going to do to defend ourselves from swarms of killer drones? We don't control everybody in this planet. And um, it's a very altruistic thing that you guys are trying to do. But I would really like to see us have a conversation about the reality of not everybody in the world is a good guy. And do you know where I'm going with this? And um, I don't know, but is there anybody in the industry that makes these things in the audience? <laughs> no, no pressure. No pressure. And, and um, you know, as the campaign, would you... Hey, just going to throw this out there. I've 
I've worked with weapons for most of my career, and I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to say, but I have I have opinions. Okay, <laughs> great. We're we're really excited about that. I'd love to have this conversation. And thanks, Big Easy. I mean, I truly appreciate you chiming in and, and trying to help guide this discussion. I mean, we do have two hours. Um, so we prepared the first hour to be a really kind of philosophical discussion about why this is... Well, not... I'd like to see the philosophical discussion start. Like to hear what Liz yeah. and Lyda have to say. Absolutely yeah. great. Yeah. But we're definitely going to answer that question. Yeah. Obviously, we get it a lot. Yep, Absolutely. <laughs> So fundamentally, the ethics of these weapons come down to our inherent right to life and what it means for a machine algorithm to take a human life or to harm a human life. And so what, how does that degrade human dignity? That's really the moral and ethical question that we're talking about. If you deploy a fully autonomous weapon, you're basically committing an extrajudicial killing that would automate that decision and take out the necessary human judgment from this process, and you would mechanically slaughter at scale and at speed. That's that's what we're talking about. Um, the the technologies that exist today are, you know, just so nascent. Um, but that is like the big moral thing that we're asking here. Yeah. And I think we can all agree on this point that we have the right to life. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> maybe not. For folks who have questions, please uh, use the microphone. Okay, um, let's take a couple questions. I'll just make the comment that in any era of history, weapons of war turned against civilians has been horrific whether it's, you know, a Roman legion with spears or, you know, machine guns being pointed at a crowd. So when you're talking about AI weapons, you're talking about things which are able to be much more discriminate and much more precise. So much faster. Right. Yes, precisely. So the example would be it's not really a decision here of is the F-15 going to drop 500 pounds of hate onto a house? It's what is going to be contained in that 500 pound package? And Right now, the answer is high explosive. In the future, maybe the answer could be 500 pounds of some kind of robot. And to give, to give an example of why this would be important, um, in the late 2000s, there was a terrorist in Pakistan named Batil Masood who was uh, killed in an explosion. His wife was also killed in that same explosion. And by all accounts, she was not directly involved in Masood's terrorism. If the option had been available to attack only the individual target and to reduce the collateral in, in this sense, um, the ethical thing for a warfighter to do would be to use the more precise and more specific option. Now, additionally, as far as like human in the loop goes, right now we do have weapons for snipers, which are officer in the loop weapons, where essentially the sniper has a pair of handcuffs on he acquires the target, the video feed goes home, and he has to get layers of approval before he can actually take the shot. Those systems exist. So I'm, I'm not really clear on why you're against the like very low-level autonomous targeting, because if, if at the end of the day you can say that the National Command Authority is the only human in the loop with warfighting, that means that you don't have 17-year-olds making difficult moral decisions. And as you gave the example of, you know, uh, a president could order um, the military to fire on rioters. Historically, dictators have had people who are willing to fire on rioters. Um, and yes, it's, it's true, they could refuse. But if the only person making that moral decision to fire on an unarmed crowd happens to be the political decision maker in charge, and he bears the full moral weight of that, we can deal with him in a way that's much easier to deal with than people who say, well, I'm only following orders. Now, furthermore, you you make, have a good one. Do you have a question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'd love to hear them finish, because people aren't even letting them finish their talk. Maybe they have the answers to all of your questions. I'm sorry, we were gonna have a discussion. I'm the CFP committee chair, and I, I thought I this was gonna they be a discussion. They worked really, really hard on their piece, and I really just love the work to say that's all. Well, Thank you. And we will, um, you know, absolutely respond to questions. I just want to take a second before we get back into the explanations, because I, 
you know, and Ramon makes a point there, there are some slides in here that will address the specific concerns about integrating AI into warfare when we're talking about, um, you know, this new frontier. But I do think that um, I take issue with one of the things, and I'm not sure what your name is, but um, you're very insightful comments, uh, which is to say that this allegation that AI will be more precise and more controlled and do less damage. It could be. It not will be. It could be. It's so a very U.S.-centric view and not how we see weapons used in conflicts practically. Yep. And the other thing to remember about AI is it's not magic. It's just a predictive technology that takes data sets and then is able to infer what happens in the future based off of those data sets. So if your data is messy, which we all know it will be and it is, then your algorithm will be messy in a similar way. And even more than that, AI models are notoriously what we call brittle, which means they can only do exactly what we train them to do. So let's say you have a laboratory scenario where you're training a swarm of killer drones uh, to identify targets in the desert. What happens if that battlefield is not in a desert and it's actually in the snow? Um, there's lots of research in adversarial attacks about the way that there's this one famous paper about it takes a photo of a dog and a photo of a wolf and it tries to classify which one is a dog and a wolf. And the reason that they were able to find through the field of explainability prior to that, they wouldn't have been able to know that this was happening at all. But with explainability, they were able to detect that it wasn't the animal itself that was causing that prediction to occur. It was actually the snow in the background. And so when you analyze things on a pixel by pixel level, there's so much brute force computation happening that it just becomes impossible for you to understand and to account for every single scenario, for every single variance that might occur in an unpredictable battlefield scenario. Um, I think the, the alarm that we're trying to raise here is that these technologies are so new, so risky, and so poorly understood that to rush forward into autonomy based off of these kinds of detection systems is unacceptable, and especially when you're not involving sufficient human control, which maybe a general designates an area where this drone flies around and then says, you know, kill all the battle-aged men in this area. So how do we do this better? Well, <laughs> can you just quickly define this? What's this? So um, just in general, like what uh, ethical questions do you want us to answer? Like what, how can we help make sure this field is better? Especially when like we're talking about robots and AI, like is your focus mainly AI? Is it mainly robots? Um, how can we, you know, do AI in a way that is ethical or better to, uh, or in a way that we feel better about at the end of the day? Or how do we do that with robots? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And if you were to ask uh, different people on the campaign, you'd probably get very different answers. Um, but one thing remains kind of central to it, which is maintain meaningful human control. Uh, meaning that um, if you think about the way that, let's say there's two scenarios where we have a, a drone that is looking for a particular person or a drone that is looking or a swarm of drones that is looking for a bunch of people. Both are controlled by one person or one soldier or one general, whichever it happens to be. Um, that's a force multiplier, right? So for every one soldier, you can have 10 or 1,000 or 10,000 or a million different potential victims of this kind of weapon. Whereas, you know, with one person, one drone, one approve, approval, it tends to de-escalate the whole nation, notion of war. And so the escalation of the scale of war is a really important question for us. What is meaningful control? That is also a very good question and something that is being discussed right now at the highest levels of the international global government. Um, I think, you know, maybe, Marty, if you want to take us through some of the different interpretations of that, um, I have my own opinion of it. But Yeah, there's, there's teams of lawyers and tech workers and diplomats, military lawyers, military folks trying to answer that exact question. They're, you know, taking out their charts and what Liz talked about in the beginning of that, the targeting cycle of a weapon and... You know, Project Maven is like IDing objects or IDing targets that can be done semi-autonomously. That's already incorporated into existing armed drones. But when you're at that point where you're selecting, locking onto, and then engaging, pulling the trigger of a target, that's where we argue you have to maintain human control over those things. And yeah, you can talk about, you know, is an operator making that split-second decision actual meaningful human control? hotly debated too. And what we're advocating for is to have the discussion with policymakers. Because who's in charge are a bunch of United Nations diplomats who have been talking about this for seven years. The technology is moving super quickly. The policy has not moved at all. And they're just talking. 
They're not negotiating anything. They're not doing anything binding. They're stalling. They're stalling. So you have Russia, U.S., China, Israel, South Korea, U.K., all these guys in the same room. They recognize that this is important, um, that this is an, a topic that's worth paying attention to, but they're not doing anything about it. So that's the role of the campaign, and we're going to talk later about how we've been successful before working with the public, civil society, diplomats, in terms of actual, actually making a change. Um, but I want to talk about one really big issue, which is accountability. Yeah. Um, so this takes us back to a really important point about international humanitarian law, which exists to protect civilians and to protect everybody. Can I, can I ask one more question real quick? Or is that <laughs> moving on? Yeah, um, sure. Just do you have any proposition real quick on guaranteeing transparency for these agencies or do you like a, such as like an organization that's bipartisan? So after you initiate this uh, ban proposal, and let's say that passes, how do we guarantee that they're actually washing their hands when they exit the bathroom, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, yeah. super good. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about that later. Um, but basically, there are past international treaties that have been successful, and they bring states to the table to basically have an honest and transparent discussion where states have voluntarily given up certain types of weapons that cause indiscriminate civilian harm. And there are ways to check that and balance that. And you don't necessarily have to create a whole new agency to do so. Um, Think about biological weapons. Think about chemical weapons, landmines, cluster munitions. We're going to talk about these later. Just one quick one minor question. We should have done the FAQ first, guys. I know. What, <laughs> what specifically make uh, making the assumption that people building these weapons conform to the existing laws of warfare? Like, you know, you shouldn't target civilians. You shouldn't build things that are intentionally indiscriminate, et cetera. What specifically makes it unethical to try to replace the existing weapons in U.S. and other nations' stocks with robot weapons that continue to attempt to conform to those ideals? We argue that technology will never be able to replace human judgment. Um, and what that means is, legally, no one will be held responsible for a fully autonomous weapon malfunctioning or taking a mistake. Making a mistake. Yeah, I think that, so, you know, I'm in technology. I work, I co-founded an AI company. You know, we, we, I'm not a technophobe. I believe that AI is going to make its way into the military and very, already has, already has, and will continue to do that and expand. Um, and we hope that it will be done in a way that will reduce the loss of innocent life um, and to make warfare safer. But I also am very skeptical of this sort of techno-utopian viewpoint that assumes that AI is magic, it's going to fix everything, it will be more accurate than a human in all cases. Um, there are some very specific cases where a computer can't tell the motivation of a human uh, compared to the motivation of a, a, a civilian or a soldier. We were actually going to get to this a little bit later on, so we'll probably talk about it twice. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll just go back to the slides and you'll see when we get there. Um, so another, we were talking about international humanitarian law. And so these laws are designed to protect humans. And one of the requirements for any casualty of war is that someone, an individual, is held accountable. Um, so how do you think about that when a swarm of drones is going off to kill its set of victims based off of the click of a switch or the press of a button of a soldier uh, under the command of you know, his, his supervising officer. Uh, well, if you're using deep learning, that absolutely is impossible. Um, and there are some other fields that attempt to approximate what the cause or the explainability of this particular decision might have been. Um, but who is responsible for that mishap? Let's say it causes an atrocity. Let's say it, it, it plows down a field of protesters by accident because they're all wearing the, the wrong color or they're wearing a specific kind of hat, whatever it might be. Um, so who's responsible? Is it the soldier? Is it the general? Is it the manufacturer? Or is it the software that actually caused this you know, decision to be made? The model also has data labeling services. What if there's a spy in there? Like, what if they're mislabeling 100,000 of the million images that go into training this model? Um, the point here is I think that there's just so many different touch points where somebody's responsible for this. And it's the machine. It's not the people that made it, not necessarily. You can't hold Uber accountable. Um, even in U.S. law, we're starting to see that uh, where we would love to see uh, 
autonomous vehicles be uh, held accountable to companies like Uber who design the software and who design the hardware and sell it and profit from it, uh, that they're not going to be held accountable. And these manufacturers are kind of immune from this type of responsibility. So if there's a malfunction and a genocide occurs because of it, are you going to be able to blame the general or are you going to try to look the drone manufacturer that actually built them? Maybe it wasn't he who ordered those things to be built. Maybe it was a team of people who in the procurement office uh, made a poor decision about which company to partner with. Um, The chain of responsibility is just very, very broad. Uh, And being that this technology is so new, I think that explainability needs to come a lot farther than it already is today. Right now, we can only do explainability with proxy models, which means we train a secondary model that's similar enough to the first model, um, reverse engineering the decision and saying, these are the factors we think went into actually this kill decision. Um, But eventually, we're going to want to do that on the model itself, because in a proxy version, you're using like a linear regression, which is, you know, a very simple kind of model. And you really want something a little bit more complex and accurate to hold somebody accountable for a war crime. So that's kind of the way we're thinking about that. Um, So there are two other points in international humanitarian law that bear mentioning. There are teams of lawyers who are already out here arguing that this kind of weapon is already illegal under international humanitarian law or that it's impossible to create a weapon that could comply with the existing international humanitarian law. And Marta knows a lot more about IHL than I do. (laughs) I know the legal stuff might seem dry, but part of what we do as advocates and Basically, we're trying to outreach with the tech community and help bridge that divide so everyone understands why new law is necessary because existing law will not cover technology. So as Liz mentioned, there's two basic things uh, required, proportionality and distinction by the rules of law um, in individual attacks. So robots would lack the situational awareness, contextual understanding, and the moral reasoning to actually make what we consider a human judgment call, which is distinction and proportionality. Um, current technology can't meet those requirements. So in this example, it might seem pretty obvious. There's a killer robot and there's a small child with a teddy bear. Um, that might seem obvious. But what happens when you've got a person and maybe they're being coerced into fighting? Or maybe they're trying to surrender. How does a machine with all of its sensors and whatever facial recognition, biometric data that it has, able to actually distinguish coercion? We're talking about um, identifying like, emotional intelligence for robots and looking at motivation. Motivation. And honestly, we don't think that's going to happen, especially when you think about why it's important to consider who's creating the technology. What kind of biases do they have? What kind of cultural understandings do they have that might be missing? Um, When you think about all the theaters that the US is deployed in right now and different contexts and you have one system that's programmed and someone could be dancing in joy or grimacing in pain. Um, How is grimacing in pain different from anger about to attack? Yeah. And just to add to that before we move off this point, I do think it's important to mention that there's this notion of sentiment detection and uh, facial recognition analysis of what you're thinking or feeling based off of your face. And again, the techno utopians will look at that and say, oh, there's all these great uses we can now we can figure out whether kids are playing paying attention in school or whether um, people are actually malicious when they walk into a bank and, and tend to rob it. But the more research comes out, the more it becomes clear that your facial expression does not necessarily reflect your internal motivation or your intent or even the emotion that you're expressing. It's gotten so bad to the point where AI activists are calling it digital phrenology. Um, And you see this in research coming out of China as well. Someone claimed to have built a classifier that could identify if you were a criminal. And the way that they did it was training it off of mugshots of Chinese prisoners. (laughs) It gets better. Um, The mugshots actually when they applied, when US researchers applied explainability to the field, they found that the identifying feature that this model was latching onto was actually a smile. So imagine this deployment, this classifier deployed. This is, you know, technology that could be misused to kill anybody who they think is a criminal but is actually just smiling. Um, This is just an obvious limitation of the technology as it exists today, but there's serious questions about whether your intent or your motivation can ever be gleaned 
from your physical appearance. So go ahead and ask your question. Wait, wait. Introduce yourself, Brittany. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so my name is Straith. Um, I am a human-robot interaction specialist. Um, I focused on ro- using robots to social engineer people in the last few years as a way to um, figure out how to defend against these attacks and how to make sure that people are aware that this is an issue. So this We're is have to have a way longer talk. <laughs> yeah. This is very much like in my wheelhouse. Um, but this is what's bothering me about your presentation: is you're talking about AI, you're not talking about robots. They are so very different when you look at human-robot interaction research and when you actually look at the physicality of robots. Like, it's great you're talking about this AI, but if it's put in a robot that's this big and looks like a Barbie, it's going to have a very different effect than the robots that look like Cylons that you're using. So, like, there's some other questions there that I'm wondering about how much human-robot interaction research you're also pulling into this or if it's only AI. It's both. Uh, So, Campaign to Stop Killing Robots, really catchy name, works well, like, people get it. We're not just looking at robots. Uh, we're going to talk about like all the different technologies that we're concerned about that could be components of a system. Um, at this point, AI will be a component. It might yeah. be placed on a robotic platform or service or product, but what we're talking about is incorporating robotics and artificial intelligence. Okay. Because, yeah, it sounds very much like AI so far. And so I wonder um, how you're going to approach like the physical... Um, abilities of robots and how that plays in and where those ethics come in too. Like if you make a robot look a lot scarier than it is, obviously people are going to interact with it differently. So um, is there any steps to bring that into the campaign? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I think the campaign is always looking for experts who can contribute and help us understand uh, the fields that we're not specifically experts in. My background is in AI, and so a lot of this talk is about the AI components of it. The way that you're going to get autonomous killer drones is just not possible without AI of some kind, and biometrics is a part of that, and swarm technology is a part of that. Um, So you're right. It's not going to be about the physicality of robots for the purposes of this talk, but it's about the technologies that are needed, the ones that are being developed, and the ones that are coming in the future that actually stand to practically be, you know, applied into these weapons right now. But I would absolutely love to have more deep conversation with you about that. Okay, thanks. It's it's a big deal if you like anthropomorphize robots or um, they're they're really not going to look like the Terminator as you saw from the systems that we flashed on the screen earlier. Like, they look like weapons. Um, You could probably design a killer Barbie. Uh, I don't think DARPA's working on that yet. Not to my knowledge. (laughs) Okay, where were we? Okay, so I think, you know, a pretty easy point to make is that this kind of weapon will fundamentally change the scale and the appearance of war. Um, One thing that we tend to hear a lot is that this is a more precise weapon, that this is going to reduce human casualties. And of course, that's the way that the government wants us all to be thinking about it. Um, And of course, the government is trying to do the best by its citizens. No one's attacking, you know, the goal of defending America right now. Um, Obviously, that's necessary. But when we think about the scale of war, um, think about... I tend to look at it in terms of, you know, thinking around game theory a little bit. Um, What kinds of actions can a nation take to make war less bloody? What kinds of actions can we take as a society to press for peace? Um, And I just feel very strongly that the scale of war that will make it easy and cheap to 3D print and then deploy AI models on um, completely enclosed SDKs that would then be used en masse um, to attack a nation will cause another escalation and cause another arms race to occur. We're already starting to see that. It's not just about defense. It's also about the military industrial complex and the drive for profit and the deployment and sale of these weapons to our allies and to our, um, you know, basically to achieve proxy war. So if we build scarier, bigger weapons, it should be pretty self-explaining that uh, other countries will do the same and try to catch up. Um, So the prevailing thought is that, uh, you know, Pacifistic movements are the only thing standing in between the growth of the military industrial complex. In fact, that's what Eisenhower said in his uh, farewell address, um, is that only a well-informed public can stand against the growth and the hypergrowth of capitalism plus the uh, military industrial complex. So the cheaper they are, the easier they are to make, the less human life that is threatened to be lost by a decision to actually go to war um, is going to cause more of these weapons to be built, cause more countries to pursue the similar uh, weapons to be built. And uh, that's dangerous. So 
another thing that we're concerned about is accidental war. And uh, this is something that even our rivals are out publicly speaking about and concerned about. Um, accidental war is something that we all can kind of imagine if we've seen things like Dr. Strangelove and this system of missiles that are triggered automatically and fly back and forth, um, causing you know, a fear of a very large um, death toll. But there are some examples that actually have happened in the real world. Uh, so, for instance, you might remember the flash crash of the stock market that high-frequency trading algorithms collaborated to. Um, actually, they were kind of opposing forces by ever lower and lower prices, even just by a hair, a fraction of a cent. And ultimately, they caused the stock market to crash. Um, so that's one example. But this is present in all kinds of different places as well. So for instance, there's this one hilarious example of um, someone was selling a book on Amazon, and they were actually trying to sell it for 10 bucks or something. And because of the competing algorithms that one price, one seller had raised their price, had set their algorithm to price it at a little bit higher than the previous one, and the other one had set it to price it a little bit lower than their component, their opponent, uh, what happened was the book was sold for $38 million. And, well, it wasn't sold, but they were trying to sell it <laughs> for the, that much money. So I think the, the point here is that there are human oversight mistakes that can happen whenever you train an algorithm that if it's not being monitored, if it's not watched carefully, if it's not trained with every possible scenario in mind, um, they can fly out of control. And that's risky and dangerous. And we try not to talk about philosophically, like, well, what if you could build a perfect killer robot that did exactly what you said and could do it precisely? Um, even if you build a perfect killer robot and it interacts with, I'm not going to say the country I'm thinking of, an Indonesian killer robot, um, those are going to have unintended algorithmic inter interactions that you just can't predict. So building your own perfect technological example uh, doesn't quite work. I'm going to kind of breeze through this. Uh, the campaign did a poll uh, at some of key countries and states that are participating in the UN process, and what we hear from the public in those countries is that they do not want killer robots developed. 61% uh, of the public is against killer robots, mostly for moral and ethical reasons, which makes sense. And we hear the argument, if we don't build these weapons, someone else will a lot. Um, but even the United States doesn't sell weapons to some countries, usually for human rights um, reasons, sometimes political reasons. Um, so that's not a good enough argument. Like, we're talking about humanity and who we want to be and what kind of technologists and roboticists and just human citizens of this global planet. We're talking about international security, not just national security. So we are at DEF CON, and um, there is another concern that's a more practical concern, less of an ethical concern. Um, but again, we, we think it's important to bring up all of the scenarios that might actually make us vulnerable. And um, so hacking is a, a real concern here. Uh, when you have a completely... When you have a completely closed system, uh, you might think that that makes it impervious to this kind of attack, but um, there have already been cases of captured drones. And if we are deploying AI into our weapons, this becomes kind of the secret sauce and something that is highly desirable for these adversaries to capture. And so we can see things like boundary detection attacks, which would then allow uh, an adversary to understand the weaknesses of one of the models that's seeking to select and destroy the targets. And if they do that, then they would have have this information simply to be able to avoid targeting or to create some sort of adversarial approach that would defeat the targeting process entirely. Um, so adversarial attacks are a real concern. Um, another, another example of this is Microsoft Tay. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> Um, so this is a very funny little chatbot that Twitter attacked en masse and decided to make it racist, because that's fun. Um, and so, you know, Microsoft deployed this little chatbot, which was completely harmless, but because people fed it the kind of data that was um, racist and offensive, uh, it also started reflecting that through the process of semi-supervised or unsupervised learning. It's a little unclear how they achieved that in the chatbot. But basically, the data that it took, it was able to learn off of that, and that transformed its prediction ability and its ability to generate generate language. Um, so that's obviously a toy example, but uh, these kinds of attacks are going to get more and more sophisticated. Uh, in fact, every technology, almost every technology in AI is dual use. That really kind of glowing glimmer of hope that I mentioned before, explainability. Explainability is also a technology that can be used to detect the boundaries and to understand where the weaknesses of the model are. Um, so dual use technology is a real 
problem uh, with regard to kind of thinking about what your own ethical and moral lines are in regard to what you work on. But uh, it's certainly something that needs to be addressed. So would it be better if this is all like completely open source where anybody could see it or how should we go about, you know, making good defenses or making good choices or making those ethical decisions? Great question. I think open sourcing things is definitely one way to go about it. I'm just going to kind of think through your question a little bit because I, I wonder even if you were to do that, then you might also have, um, classified data sets. You know, I think when we're talking about defensive technology, it would be great if we could say, let's have it all be open and transparent. But at the very least, I think, you know, a big part of the reason why I've joined the campaign is because I think that this kind of enforcement needs to come at the international level. Um, we as people, as software engineers, can't be responsible for the kinds of technologies that what what they want and what they will use. But what we can be responsible for is making sure that um, the law stops this kind of uh, weapon from being built. So another thing that's happened in Canada recently is the drone laws have changed quite a bit. So you're not even allowed to have drones inside your house necessarily because they are too close to people. Um, so, and this comes because of the issues with drones in uh, airspace, for example, and being close to um, oh, airports and things like that. So those laws are like affecting people's hobbies, affecting people's fun, affecting the art that we can create. Because even if you wanted to make an artistic show with drones, you have to get everybody to sign off now, apparently, that they are okay being within the uh, minimum range that a drone's allowed to be away from you. So, like, how do you think these laws are going to affect hobbyists and just industry and outside of the military scope? Like, is that okay as well, that we put these laws on and they're going to have unintended consequences across the board? Yeah, we get that question a lot, too, in terms of, like, how, how would a ban affect research and development and hobby use, too? Um, basically, the Biological Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention did not stop biologists and chemists from being able to experiment and use that technology for good. What we will see if we see fully autonomous weapons deployed is a huge pushback on robotics and AI and any other tech that's incorporated into it. Um, the campaign tries to, to do our best to not fear monger and just be realistic about where this technology is going. Um, there could be public pushback. So it, there's both sides of the coin. I, I think a treaty, I know a treaty, would have um, you know, uh, components of it that would allow for transparency, which is kind of the open source stuff that you're talking about, and bringing states to the table. But uh, international treaties are not as strong as they may seem. They set norms, and they take a long time to really see the effects on the battlefield already. And they very rarely, I can't think of an example, that would restrict uh, actual you know, development for good. We want to see AI for good. So there is an international treaty that for some robotics that you cannot update them, period. That, that is in the agreement is that once you have a robot and it has been approved that it can't be updated. And as security people, we love our updates. Like that thing is making sure that things are secure. But um, there are some robots that I've played with that automatically reset as soon as you update because that's part of, the, part of the law around it is that you can't update the robot. So like that's something that happens. So how do we avoid situations like that? I will have to look at my papers again. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's more on the hardware side and not thinking about the social side and not thinking about the um, software side. So it's a hardware treaty, I think, between uh, Japan, Germany, and a few other countries. Yeah. Yeah, super question. And I think, um, thank you for giving me a chance to say this because I, I really think that the one thing that we need more than anything in this discussion right now is more experts and more expert voices. Um, so I was going to tell the story a little bit later on, but... Um, earlier this year, I was in Geneva at the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, uh, which is a treaty meeting of a group of governmental experts that get together to try to discuss what are our policies going to be on this. Um, and I was one of maybe two or three people who had ever trained a model in the room uh, and understood what the limitations are, what the current research is. Um, and it was really shocking to me to hear these delegates who are responsible for governing the ways that countries work together and, and, and interact, especially in the warfare realm, um, is to say that they didn't know what they were talking about. And that's when you get ham-handed le legislation that restricts people's hobbies. You know, we don't want to 
take your autopilot drones away. <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense at all. But what we've been saying is that we want to prevent commanders from being able to deploy large swarms of 3D printed weapons or bombs that can find people based off of flawed and, per- and predict, uh, potentially uh, forever imperfect uh, biometrics data. So we need your help. <laughs> we need everybody's help. If you are in AI, if you're in robotics, if you're in ethics, if you build software or SDKs, you probably know and you're proving here that you know a lot more about this specific topic than, than I do. Um, but I'm also a member of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control with Peter Asaro, who's noted roboticist and Noel Sharkey. And they are robotics experts. They were in the room um, as well. So we need more people like that. And let's talk about how we can help you get involved and help your voice be heard. We've got two things that we want to cover. Maybe we can do like 15 minutes and then do Q&A after that. Basically, we want to talk talk about the tech worker movements that are happening and what technology workers are already doing to influence um, what's happening on this topic. Yep. Now, Seven minutes. Oh, a challenge. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> you in the room in Geneva. Um, <laughs> and then we want to talk about the campaign, past successes, and how you can get involved, which is really important stuff. So, sound good? And then we take questions. Liz, why don't you tell your story? Okay. That's really important. All right. So, um, now... What we're talking about here is dual-use technology. Just like biological weapons or chemical weapons, the AI models that you train for computer vision, for biometrics, for whatever, for swarm collaboration, can be used for good or they can be used for evil. And we've also talked a little bit about Directive 3000.09, which is a lie. (laughs) I'll go so far as to say it has loopholes. It's very, very holy. Um, Which means that, you know, it feels like the government is trying to mislead the public and, and sort of assuage fears of uh, the kinds of things that we've been talking about. So uh, up until January of this year, I worked for a company called Clarify, which was a computer vision company, uh, one of the Project Maven uh, contracting companies. And I kind of looked around the world and I saw that the technology to build autonomous and fully autonomous weapons was around already today. Um, And so I felt very strongly. I asked my CEO to sign a pledge uh, that he would never allow this technology to be used in this way. And when he refused, I quit. Um, So this is a reflection of what's happening in technology today. Uh, Because these DOD policies are vague and they're unclear and they have loopholes um, and they seem to be misleading in some cases, um, there isn't anything to stop any government, including the U.S. and and undemocratic nations, from building this kind of weapon and escalating the national, um, the international scale of war. So uh, I think that's what a lot of the people in the tech workers movement are feeling and seeing as well, that um, we need to have more attention paid to, you know, our ability to choose, our right to choose what we work on and our right to know what we're working on. Um, And we see every day that a lot of these workers don't feel comfortable producing tools that increase lethality without their knowledge or consent. Um, One example is the Microsoft HoloLens, which is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a gaming headset um, that was an AR device that would help you, you know, play volleyball or whatever you wanted to do. Um, But Without their knowledge or consent, the workers, um, the executives at Microsoft decided to sell it to the military for the express purpose of increasing lethality. Um, So now we're talking about um, a device that was supposed to be completely harmless, but is clearly, you know, very, very harmful. Um, And 300 Microsoft workers tried to push back on the management and say that they didn't feel comfortable with their work being used to this end. um, And they were unsuccessful. But there have been other examples of very successful movements. Google is the prime example of this, where collective bargaining and working together succeeded in making sure that Google dropped out of Project Maven and that they changed a lot of their policies, including an end to forced arbitration. Um, these, These movements are very exciting and very hopeful for us that... Um, the continued support from the public, from the people who are building this technology, who know firsthand its limitations and its promise, um, that these voices are important to be heard in this debate. And so that's why we're very supportive of this notion of tech won't build it. Yeah, so I'm a Silicon Valley lead for the campaign. So I kind of see firsthand when words like 
the defense in Virginia and DARPA and Jake are courting Silicon Valley companies and saying things like, we need help with humanitarian aid delivery and logistics and for medical purposes, which are all good things. The campaign is not against commercial tech companies working with the military, not against AI, not against robots. Um, what we are concerned about is that commercial tech workers are a little different. They're not your casual Lockheed and Northrop Grumman, the, the arms defense contractors that we normally think of. They have obligations to the public and their technology can be used for many different things. Um, their workers aren't always US citizens. So if you're asking someone to create technology for the US military that could be potentially used to harm their loved ones wherever the US military may be engaged, that's a really big thing. Um, the Google Project Maven protest, that was 4,000 people signed a letter across globally across Google um, through forums, through chats, through Google groups. They got together and they said, you know, we're going to make a difference. These are people who did not perceive themselves as activists. They were engineers. They were asked to create things like stopgap computers and um, a lot of the work was also contracted out. Contractors don't have as much decision-making power. They don't have as much um, insight into what they're actually developing whatever tech they're working on for. And that was a big thing. Workers have a right to know what they're working on. And what happened with Google, as you can see here, is that they faced huge reputational damage for this. And so they got a lot of support from the academic community and from the international community for taking a stand. And while the workers at Microsoft were not successful in dropping the Army IBAS HoloLens contract, Google was. Um, and they came up with AI principles, which have their own issues, but they said they would not develop warfare technology. That was in 2018, and it was a huge, huge success, an example of why tech worker movements work, um, and that you should never feel alone when you're tackling a subject as deep as this. And now it's all about implementation of how do you actually, what does it mean to not build warfare technology? What does it mean across all of Google's entities? Do they, can they invest in companies that work on fully autonomous weapons? Those are the kind of questions that are being asked now. Um, and also workers that raise concerns, they often face retaliation. So we gotta make sure that workers are free to bring up concerns and to have these discussions um, within their industry, with their colleagues. Uh, and that's that's what builds transparency. So, just to kind of, this is the major thing we're concerned about, yeah. dual use tech. It's a little bit daunting when you look at all the different technologies that become individual components of uh, this kind of weapon and weapons in general. But, um, you know, again, not technophobic. And I'm not saying by any means that we shouldn't continue to try to push the limits of deep learning and computer vision and all of these types of technologies that stand to do cancer diagnosis and rescue people on rooftops during natural disasters, of course. Um, that's why I think that their individual voices are needed on the policy level, writing your Congress people, writing to your your state and city representatives telling your CEOs or the people who have the power to communicate with our government directly that you care. Um, there are people, there are often opportunities for the public to comment. And even though the Defense Department is often very quiet about these opportunities, they do exist. And you're able to express your view. I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt you, but I'm going to give you five more minutes. It's already been eight minutes. Does anybody in the room know where I can buy moldable glue? <laughs> Sorry, fries is almost out of business. I've already emptied them out anyway. So I have to go find some things to keep the conference glued together, literally. Um, uh, Brittany is my proxy. I really would like to see the conversation get towards... I have been experienced with malware writing and automated malware writing and detection of folks for advertising purposes over the years, which is a quite similar to the same type of technology that is going to be deployed in autonomous, whatever you want to call these things. This is going to happen. I think it cannot be stopped. That's where we disagree. 
<laughs> well, we live in a society where we have freedom. There are societies where there is no freedom. And we need to figure out a way. How are we going to contain this technology because we can't control the entire planet? International humanitarian law has been successful in banning weapons before. It is possible and we can do it again. I think their answer is policy, right? But policy does not ban these weapons. It just makes them classified. <laughs> um, I'd like to see a citation there. But, um, <laughs> it's classified. <laughs> it's classified, you're right. Um, yeah, so again, the, the group of people that we're working with in the campaign to stop killer robots are Nobel Prize winners for their work on deproliferation and nuclear uh, war. Um, so I think that we have every reason to believe that since we've been successful in doing this before, that we can do it again. And a lot of the benefits can be achieved with semi-autonomous systems that would not cause the extinction of humanity. Um, <laughs> no, you can achieve precision and accuracy without ceding that critical human judgment decision to take a human life to a machine. Uh, so we have hope. We hope you guys have hope too. Um, these are the examples of the past treaties that the campaigners that work with us have successfully done. And we have seen them, oh sorry, no. We have seen the consequences of this. Um, soldiers aren't dying en masse from mustard gas attacks in wars anymore. Um, the notable one here is the blinding lasers ban, which was super influential because it was a preemptive ban, which means there's precedence for banning a technology before it is deployed, before there are victims, before we see all the horrific injuries. Um, landmines used to kill thousands upon thousands, mostly civilians, years after the conflict ended. Those were banned in 97, and we are progressively seeing those numbers go down, where now only a select few non-state armed groups use landmines in um, usually inter intrastate conflicts. Right. So treaties have an impact. They set norms. They bring the international community together. And all of those weapons that are up there that you don't see used on a regular basis is because there's international law in place. If we didn't have that, you would see massive indiscriminate civilian heart. So it is possible. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. And there are a couple more meetings coming up later this year in Geneva and in New York City. So if any of you are passionate about this issue and would like to help us out, let's talk about it. These are kind of our 10 quick points. You can also find them in the back for like ways tech workers can get involved from like low effort, signing a pledge might seem like not big impact, but for us showing growing numbers of technologists who support our cause is super important. Diplomats love data and numbers. Um, so that's where you can sign a pledge. Obviously donating funds. Uh, Liz does all of her work pro bono. I work full time for the campaign. We are very, very small. There are four full-time staff on the campaign. Um, and we support the work of 116 organizations. Everyone from doing a small policy roundtable in Cameroon, educating policymakers there, to a campaigner going to a tech conference in Argentina and talking to folks like you, but doing it in Spanish. Um, we do a lot of like translation services to make sure that this isn't a US campaign. This isn't a U.S. issue. It's all about international security, international effort, and what it takes is working with technologists, it takes working with AI experts, robotic experts, working with religious leaders, working with youth. We were just at the World Scout Jamboree. I don't know if anyone was a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. We talked to thousands of kids who got it really quick. We did some simulated um, kind of robotic ex experiments and I mean, just to see their action and they're like, okay, what can we do to help? Gives me hope for a future generation. But um, I don't know, who's ever called their congressman or written to them? Yes, good job, guys. I used to work for state government, and I was like the one on the other end of all those calls who relayed them to the representative. It works, I promise, because it's not just you calling in. There's usually like multiple people a day, multiple calls a day. So that's really important. Um, basically talk about this. Um, 
we try to speak at tech conferences to kind of bridge that policy tech gap. Um, if you have a blog, if you have a podcast, if you have if you're an Instagram influencer, whatever it may be, talk about it. Say that you were here, pick up some swag, um, stick it on your laptop. Visibility is really important. Hold an event on this. You know, you have a network of industry peers. Talk about this issue because um, a lot of you have heard about it, which is great. And now we just want to foster more debate on it. Um, if you have particular skills, unique ones, come talk to me. I can uh, tell you more about volunteering. And lastly, if you are working on killer robots or your company is, you can whistleblow internally or you can whistleblow externally and we can provide legal help and access to media. But that is last effort. We don't want anyone to have to quit their job in order to make an impact because not everyone can afford to do so. That is absolutely the last step. Um, we can do this. Oh, thank you. All right. <laughs> So we want to thank our speakers again for uh, doing this talk. Uh, if you have a question, please come up to the mic. And uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So the list of banned weapons you had, um, mustard gas like has a recipe, right? And like landmines are a kind of basic design, right? There, there's certain components you know you know are definitely in it. Like you step on it and you're done, right? Um, killer robots is like what is a weapon? Um, so for example, like there are the three things robots usually do first are dirty, dangerous, or dull are dull are their three main jobs. Uh, dangerous is usually something that might involve something we could call a weapon, like a drill that they use in mining or arc welders or things like that. So like, how does that factor into the description of what a killer robot is? Like, is that even defined? No, it's very hard. And it's, you know, in the meetings in Geneva with the diplomats, it seems like every country has their own flavor of definition of the versions of it. Um, but there are some key parts that are consistent across all of them. Um, meaningful human control is one of them. Um, and having a human in the loop is kind of a mandatory piece of that. But the truth is we are, I mean, not we, we have our definition of what uh, we are looking to outlaw. But as a global community, we are looking for a shared definition of what this means. You know, does it require that AI is involved? I mean, that's a possible way that that conversation could go. I'm not sure that it will, but um, but it is possible. And I think, um, you know, if you tear apart the, the motivations of the potentially, you know, bad actors, um, there's a lot of commonality, but it's not written in stone yet. And actually, this has been ongoing for many years and is continuing to go. And what is the next meeting in Geneva about? It's like to draft the principle. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> International treaties will rarely have like hardware, software labels, at least um, in the humanitarian disarmament arms control world. It would probably be super general. It would say we prohibit fully autonomous weapons and we need to ensure meaningful human control. That would be like the definition. And then states are free to interpret that and then that would be um, solved via case law at the international and national level. Um, you actually don't want to include specifics in an international treaty because then you bind it in time. And some aspects of artificial intelligence, robotics, whatever you may be, all the dual use technologies we talked about, um, if we create a treaty banning specific things, there's aspects of it that we can't even imagine right now. So we want to make sure that this treaty outlasts all of us. Hi. You Hi. guys brought up a lot of good points during your talk, but I had one question about sort of the culpability aspect that you discussed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go back and use the example you guys used about you can't tell, right? A robot can't tell someone's being coerced to fight. Mm -hmm. the, where, where I'm confused though is I don't think human fighters are sometimes able to do that, right? We've, we've fought wars in history where entire masses of people have been conscripted and guess what? They got gunned down just like the guys who picked up a gun willingly. Um, same point. We've, there have been times where people who were shot surrendering. And yes, it's a war crime, but it, it happened. So um, it, it feels to me like you're saying simultaneously we should have a human in the loop, but we're also going to hold AI to a standard that we don't even necessarily hold human soldiers to. Do you like this? Might be a, something where I'm misreading it. But can you square that circle? No, I think that that's a very fair question. But um, you know, there are some other statistics that I might mention, which is, um, gosh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but during World War 
one or two, um, there was research done about how many shots that were aimed versus how many shots were aimed to kill. And it was less than half, I think, were aimed to kill. So there's kind of this conscientious objection that goes into conscripted warfare also that allows people to, you know, vote their conscience by not, you know, killing the, the people in Vietnam that they would otherwise be ordered to kill. Um, so I think the difference here is the guarantee that a machine will never be able to make a conscious choice about it. And even in, um, you know, Army of None, the seminal book on autonomous weapons, the first example is of uh, the author is deployed. He was in a battle zone and he saw a young child with a very large gun and the child was not moving to kill them or threaten or harm them. Um, but a similarly trained robot that is t t trained to detect, does this person have a gun and has authorization to kill without approval from a human will not have any of that opportunity. So I think that it's yet to be seen exactly the degree to which this will increase bloodiness, but there's real solid reason to believe that it will. And our role as civil society is to make the big ask. We're asking for a ban on fully autonomous weapons. What usually happens is policymakers and others get their hands on it and they water it down. So we are not going to weaken our call. We are going to have humanity aspire to uh, you know, have, have the laws of war that we do and constantly aspire to a higher standard, more humane type of warfare. Um, someone has to play that role. You know, we have to aspire to that. Uh, in terms of holding machines to a higher standard as humans, you know, when this Spears were invented, I was like, changing the nature of warfare, so will killer robots. But you're, you're constantly kind of updating your definitions of that. Um, my question sort of related to the last questions, actually, in terms of explainability. Mm -hmm. So there is also a growing body of evidence that suggests that in human psychology, our decision-making processes are not half as explainable as we'd like them to be. Even in conductive war, in, in conductive daily decision-making, we're influenced by external factors that we're not conscious of, or we retroactively explain the decisions that we made at a time. In a time of warfare, when you are making split-second decisions and life and death decisions, it is very unlikely that that poor 17 year old oh where are you there the poor 17 year old who's only just been deployed or he's on his first time or the poor veteran who's been deployed on his sixth or seventh mission and probably has a severe case of ptsd is going to make decisions that are not optimal and then therefore like you know retroactively justify that so i guess it comes to a question of if we are holding machines to a higher standard then is that a fair standard to be held when human decision making is equally imperfect and unexplainable and where you know we do mental gymnastics to like justify those decisions in warfare as well i mean is our problem with just warfare fundamentally or is it a particular use that of technology that enhances warfare in a way that we haven't seen before yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. It's actually one that I haven't heard before, so I'm really excited to think this through while I stall a little bit for time. Um. <laughs> well, think, think of it this way. Like, neural networks are based on the biological functions of the human brain, and we haven't deciphered the human brain yet. But they're, they're really just inspired by the human brain. They're not based, based on it. And I think, you know, to your point, if we don't understand ourselves, then we can't understand the machine. But there's no other option. It, it's not about warfare in general. It's about laws that require that somebody is accountable and that we can explain the rationale behind a decision to kill somebody. Even if a human being is lying, you know, I mean, that's a vulnerability of every law that people can lie to try to get out of having broken the law. But a machine, we can't understand the wildly different mistakes that it makes. Like a human being is not going to go into a war zone and you know, um, like kill all the ducks for some reason, you know, maybe they will, but a machine could absolutely Have you seen soldiers decide. waiting long periods of time with nothing to do? Okay. <laughs> like, seriously, guys. <laughs> Fair enough, but I'm trying, I was trying to think of some sort of like outlandish example that would never ever happen, but I failed miserably. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think so we, we only have the two options, right? If we're going to have war, it's humans or machines or both. Um, but, uh, but I definitely think that the kinds of outlandish decisions that machines make, especially at this nascent point in the technology, are a lot riskier. Um, and so the, the degree of, of, of harm that we're looking at in delegating this kind of decision over to a machine um, is a little bit riskier. Oh. And Maybe the 17-year-old is a disingenuous example because when we talk about armed drone warfare right now, 
think about like a high value target, you have a lot of eyes on that target. You've got lawyers, you've got soldiers, you've got policymakers. Um, so it's very rarely just one soldier kind of making individual kills in a high value target situation. So it's already actually adding more brains to the decision. Still semi-autonomous, still human control. So really that's what we're advocating for. You can use the technology to lift the fog of war slightly, but you will never lift it fully. So does that mean you guys are sort of fairly comfortable as part of the campaign with uses of autonomous technology that still have the human in the loop or on the loop so that where the technology is augmenting the human? Like, are you reasonably comfortable with that? Because I just noticed that none, neither of you have mentioned the AI, like the White House AI strategy, which puts ethics supposedly very much at the centre of it and says very clearly that it won't be about fully autonomous weaponry. It would only about be about autonomous weapons or well, semi-autonomous weapons augmenting the human soldier. I think you'll have a variety of different opinions on that front. I do think that machine augmented human um, you know, participation in this, this kind of question is acceptable under certain circumstances, which I you know, can't define off the top of my head. But, um, but I do see a need for uh, the, you know, as I mentioned, that I have reason to believe that these kinds of weapons already exist and that various governments are willing to deploy them as they are right now, regardless of whatever policy 3000.09 claims to say. There's a lot of amazing organizations working on you know, human augmentation or on armed drones. The campaign, since we're small and we're trying to, we have one concrete goal. So we don't really take a position on the other things. The campaign's goal, thankfully, it's on this one. We have to keep it narrow and laser focused like that in order to actually achieve it. So we work with a lot of people that work on different aspects of the problem and they have various opinions. Um, but you know, that's, the campaign is strictly focused. Thank you. Cool. Sure. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So I have two questions for you. Um, so you, you mentioned that all of these weapons have been banned and you look forward to banning killer robots. So are you worried about the stockpiling aspect of that? Because we may have banned biological weapons, but we have huge stockpiles of smallpox, other diseases. Same case for probably all of those. So what is there any way to address that? Because in my mind, that may be an even bigger risk because we could pull those out at a moment's notice and no one would have any counter to that. That's a fair argument. I think a lot of these non-binding policies and like national AI strategies and Directive 3000.09, um, they're great in peacetime. We're having these philosophical debates. We're talking. It's important. What happens when, I mean, hopefully, you know, World War Three breaks out, but those kinds of non-binding things go out the window. Uh, that's why international treaties are important because it gives two people, three people, four people, whoever is involved in the war, the same standards. Um, on the stockpiling aspect, all of these, I think except for blinding lasers, in the treaty they have a section on stockpile destruction and timelines for that, how to do that, and states who don't have the money to do stockpile destruction, they can actually get funds from other states. So it really puts this framework in place to carry that out. Um, it is built on trust, though. A lot of them don't have... Uh, international inspection regimes, so no one's going in and saying, have you destroyed all your cluster bombs? But states are literally voluntarily taking pictures, taking people, and they are being proud of, look, we actually did this. It's, or we actually destroyed our stockpile. It's a big celebration when they do, um, and they're able to stick to these timelines, they're able to ask for extensions, we're just creating a framework um, that works and that states are signing on to. Was your second question? Uh, so, what does your do you have a stance on um, applying fully autonomous technologies to destroy other fully autonomous technologies? So, in my view, uh, the only conceivable way that you could actually enforce that treaty or idea would be through AI. So, I mean, it seems like you would be against that, but if the ultimate effect was to save lives or prevent that technology from taking over, would you be in support of that or would you say it's too risky? 
Good military commanders will tell you that warfare is asymmetrical, and that if you, you know, if you're fighting a gun with a gun, you're just going to lose a lot of lives, and you're not going to achieve what you're actually trying to achieve. But you create tactics and other techniques to combat whatever um, the enemy is using. So if you have a killer robot facing a killer robot, and it has these unintended interactions that I mentioned that you can't control, you're not actually going to want to use that. You're going to use some other type of technology that might be similar or incorporate elements of it, but you're going to want something that gives you control and gives you a level of predictability. Well, I mean, you're going to need you're going to need something even more lethal than these, right? So, wouldn't that be kind of an escalation at that point? Absolutely, it would be. So, I think the point here is to think about what the reactions to building these technologies would be, and that's why we're seeking a preemptive ban. Um, so, I think does anybody if you have have you ever seen the movie Terminator Three? I was like. <laughs> I really like this movie, um, not because of the AGI component or like the general intelligence component, but because like it's got really big explosions, like really, really big scale explosions, like trucks running into walls and just destroying stuff left and right. Um, and I kind of feel that that's really representative of what machine on machine warfare would look like, because, you know, you're not going to be able to train the machines to kind of understand every potential scenario where they're going to be deployed. And what if they're deployed next to like a big building, you know, that they could then crash into and destroy. I just think that the scale of the damage and destruction that these weapons will do when pitted against each other um, or when, you know, opposed by asymmetrical forces would be all negative. So in that case, it's again, de-escalation over escalation. Daniel knows a little bit about what could happen. <laughs> uh, a little. I, I obviously study this. I, Thank you for doing this talk, by the way. I'm obviously a big supporter of the campaign to stop killer robots. I thought I'd bring up the elephant in the room, which is that I, th I think a lot of people support the development of these because they think they're going to make them safer. I think that's essentially what it gets down to. <clears throat> yes, they may have all the problems you describe, but they're thinking that those are going to be happening elsewhere. And they think that this might give us some edge to preserve ourselves. And I, I kind of wanted to ask your opinion about this a little, because I, I think in many ways people don't realize that modern society in particular, like ours, would be more susceptible than less developed societies because, again, of big data. We, we're tracked pretty much everywhere, and that's what these algorithm, algorithms will use to target. But the other thing I'd like you to discuss you to discuss if you can is the second and third order effects of these. Let's say these weapons function perfectly. I think there's still a huge problem with them in that they'll change us. And I think that goes back to the way conflict works. Conflict has always been a means by which people resolve differences. And the shape of the conflict determines what society looks like. So if you need a lot of people to resolve conflicts, you tend to distribute decision making. And that's friendly to democracy. But if you centralize decision-making in conflicts, you change society. And I think one of the really serious effects of these weapons is that you will need less people to conduct conflicts, which will undermine. It's like an acid that will erode democracy, which is really the foundation and the whole point. So again, you know, with respect to everybody here who works in, in this industry, that's my chief concern is if they work perfectly, they're still perfectly awful. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about that if I could. Yeah, I, I, just, I completely agree. I think that removing the human capital and kind of like PR damage to war will absolutely make it easier for generals to deploy war. Um, we saw a really dramatic escalation in drone attacks just from simple manned drones. Um, that distance created um, psychological safety for people to be able and be more comfortable um, in deploying and, and in the use of killing. And if it's even more escalated when you're pressing a button and you're just seeing some, you know, not even a video feed coming back. There isn't one. All you see are points of radar on a screen and, you know, like a Pac-Man eating them up. Um, and that would, again, you know, that would make it easier, cheaper, um, and more dangerous and more bloody for us to attack other nations, which is something that, you know, pacifists don't really want to be able to do. Um, so yeah, Marta. Um, I, I think it's a good point on the, like, developed countries, maybe less developed countries, because I think a lot of people, including with armed drone warfare, they're able to distance, distance themselves, as Liz said, um, from the conflict. And I would be 
I would pay twenty dollars if you can name all the places the U.S. is like actively deployed in them. Um, the public doesn't really know, and that's a huge issue for democracy and for transparency. And with these weapons, oftentimes we think about big, complicated systems that are super expensive to build and acquire. But what we're seeing is that you can shrink them and make them smaller and cheaper um, and dumber and not actually follow. Like The United States is trying to develop autonomous weapons that can follow the rules of war. We don't think that's possible. But like other countries are not trying to do the same thing. And that's where the danger comes in, um, where anyone can get their hands on them. And that's why we need controls. I think we're, we've got... Ten more minutes, so five minutes. Okay, last two questions, and then. So. Cool. This will be well. One, thank you both for doing this. This was like very interesting and helpful. So the question I have is um, somewhat relevant and tangential. So we're living in a society where machines will make more decisions for us, where many of these are life and death decisions. So what is the framework we use to rationalize this? And it doesn't have to be autonomous weapons per se. The classic example is autonomous cars. Like today, a human driver kind of prioritizes the life of the driver, typically over the life of the pedestrians, if you were to engage in an accident as kind of an aggregate. So what are the frameworks and like ways we think about just machines making more decisions for us in our day-to-day -day lives, where autonomous cars are like the, the prime one? Can I just ask a cl clarifying question? Sure. What do you mean by frameworks? Well, you, you posed a whole bunch of questions about how, how should we think about autonomous weapons and the aggregate of C's policy to prevent the development of them and, and the use of them. We will be in a society that machines do make life or death decisions. We're deploying autonomous cars on the road. Legislation seems relatively friendly that this, this is a thing that will happen. But in those cases, machines are making life and death decisions about that. So how do we deploy technology where algorithms and software will make decisions for us? Uh, yeah, I mean, so this is not a perfect science yet. I think that's what's so fascinating about AI ethics right now is that it's nascent in a developing way. Um, a lot of companies and countries are arguing over what does AI principle and guardrails really look like. And everybody disagrees. I mean, just like the privacy legislation in the EU, people are looking for meaningful control over their own data. And legal scholars are arguing about it left and right. Um, so I would, you know, I don't have an answer for that necessarily, but I can say that sufficient guardrails, sufficient human control, monitoring, explainability, all of these things are going to be important, understanding bias. Um, and I, you know, bias is asymptotic, meaning it's like, you're never going to get to a completely cured model of bias. So we need laws to understand what is a sufficient degree of bias for various use cases, for various applications of it. Um, somewhere there are more life and death decisions, like higher degrees of that, we'll probably have to have lower, you know, um, percentages of bias under different protected categories. And then once you finish up with one protected category, you need to add all of the rest of them um, over time. So um, I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but it's kind of where we're at right now. But it's helpful. <laughs> but the point is actually, you know, having that policy in place. Um, I think autonomous vehicles are a little different because they're not designed to kill, and fully autonomous weapons are literally designed to be lethal. So we try not to draw too many connections there, but obviously any policy that's uh, developed around AVs and around like cybersecurity and cyber warfare will also influence uh, the policy debate happening here. Can I do one small pushback? So uh, autonomous vehicles, but like they'll never be perfect. So right now there's 35,000 deaths in the U.S. from autonomous from, from regular cars. Yeah. If we get 10x better than human drivers, that's still 3,000 per year. So at some point, these cars will, will kill people. They will have to make decisions. I think we'll never get to zero in, in the far, far future. So at some point, it's an, it's an inherent complication of the technology. Also, Grant's done some research that suggests you can never be able to statistically test the autonomous vehicles. So it's got a low rate of error yeah. of the human driver. Yes. But that's the question. The question is not should we have autonomous vehicles. It's the question is should we have autonomous vehicles that are safer than human drivers, right? That would make tell. it something better. You can't tell unless you test it for 12 years because the rate of human driver error is still statistically incredibly rare based on the number of miles traveled in the U.S. And here's the thing about research development in the military and you know, in other places is that you're testing in a lab. You're testing in a controlled environment, and Silicon Valley likes to move fast, break things, and test things in the real world. They'll deploy facial recognition technology in some small town and see what happens, see if anyone notices, and kind of hope no one does, which is wrong. It's inherently wrong. Um, but also, if you test things in labs and then you put them 
in an environment where maybe the machine is learning on the fly. Like, is is that, are we going to allow that? Or are we going to allow it to learn only in controlled environments? What does that mean? The R&D aspect is what the military is talking about right now. <laughs> I guess it just, since we're out of time, maybe I'll... I'll summarize what I think your perspective is, and you can just say if you agree or not. Um, <laughs> yes, no, exactly. No, just that we're increasingly required, legislators are increasingly required to make technical decisions, and we increasingly find that our policymakers are not well equipped to do that. Um, but we can recall that, you know, Clausewitz said in the early 1800s, War is an extension of politics by other means. And I think as technologists in this conversation, we have to keep in mind that that's what it's really a political question that we're unfortunately you know so what's your question that's it that's my i've done <laughs> one thing yes. that you should keep in mind great quote inaction in and of itself is a political statement if, if you do nothing and you just let technology happen as it does have this submissive relationship to the tech and just let defense contractors and others who have a stake in making a lot of money from killing people and what does that mean when Google's the one that's making money killing people? Um, those are the kinds of questions for us. So uh, we want to thank again our speakers uh, for this awesome talk. And yeah.